All right, guys. Uh, so thanks for coming to this review class, the last class for the final exam. Uh, I hope that this is going to be a little, I hope it's going to be helpful for you, frankly. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over some of the key concepts from each class, really high level, really uh, what I think to be kind of the most important concepts that we covered in each class. Uh, and then we're going to go through uh, some old exam questions. So you get uh, you know, the best of both worlds, in my opinion. So one, you get to see what I think to be the most relevant, most important, essentially, <laughs> note to self, the, the most important concepts each week, uh, as well as you're going to see some old exam questions. Then we're going to go through them and get some answers as well. Uh, the final exam is April 22nd, okay, from 3 to 6 p.m. So uh, you'll have that. Okay, so let's kick it off. Um, I don't know how long the class is going to be, so we're going to take it one step at a time. If things are going, you know, taking longer than usual, uh, then we're going to speed it up. If not, then we're going to just keep it as a steady pace. This is not as much of a formal class. This is more informal. Okay, so you're going to get more out of it the more questions you ask. Okay, there's not, there's not too many of you here just yet. Sixty something, sixty four of you. Um, so the more you ask, the more I'm going to tell you, and the more I'm going to reveal, right? Like the whole Daniel and the Grammy strategy. The more you ask me, the more I will reveal, which might be helpful on your final exam. Okay, so to kick it off, what are we talking about? Well, human resource management, okay? So what we've talked about over the term is that HR is a set of integrated systems, practices, and policies, okay? So this is everything that the organization does, what mechanisms can the organizations use, what levers can they pull on in order to effectively deploy their employees, okay? Uh, one question was just asked, will the slides be posted? No, the slides will not be posted, but the video will be posted, okay? So you have to, re you have to rely on the video, okay? So HR is all about what levers can leadership, uh, the HR department, uh, managers, what levers can they pull on in order to uh, motivate, deploy, and develop their employees? Okay. Now, HRM strategy is all about is all about more of an active phase. What levers can you pull in order to achieve a strategic outcome? Okay. So, without this strategy piece, it's just simply describing what you can do to motivate and change the behaviors of the employees. Once you include the strategy piece, it's what can you do to change and motivate your employees in order to achieve X outcome? Okay, so it's based on the organizational goals or the goals of the, the founders or the CEOs. Okay, so what type of levers or systems or policies or practices uh, can they, should they be putting into place in order to develop their employees in such a manner to uh, achieve a particular outcome? Okay. The second class, you'll remember, we talked about the legal environment. Okay? So this is one of the most important frameworks I believe to be associated with the legal environment. Okay? So there's three key stakeholders within the legal environment, the employer, the employee, and the government. Okay? So if you remember correctly, um, employees have rights. Okay? So they have rights to be protected from harmful business practices as an employee in Canada, you can go about your business. You can go about your your business. Uh, there's certain expectations around how many hours you're you're supposed to work per week, uh, the minimum pay, uh, how many sick days you're allowed to take off, uh, how um, how long or how many breaks you're allowed to take off in any given day. These are the rights. How, how you're supposed to dress. Okay? These are rights that employees have to be protected from harmful business practices. Now, on the flip side, employers also have rights, particularly associated with the notion that employers can change or modify employee work terms. Caveat is if there's a legitimate business need. Okay? So the employers can't just go about changing employees' contracts um, or employees' work terms or employees' conditions if there's not a legitimate business need. And if they do, then you can get into other issues in terms of like uh, court proceedings and challenges and suing and, and hold that spectrum. But that's like a complete other class. We're going to ignore that now. Okay. Um, but em employers also have rights. So if there's changes in the external environment, a new competitor enters the workplace, um, a pandemic occurs. <laughs> if, if something happens, ex predominantly an external force uh, impacts the organization, uh, employers can change work, term or, uh, work terms. Okay. 
And then lastly, we have the government. The government plays this, I would say, a bit of the most intangible piece here because it's a little bit less known. Um, the government, in my mind, plays the role of what a referee would play in any sports. Okay? Uh, so it's the idea that they're trying to balance the needs of the employees and balance the needs of the employees. They want everybody to play fair. Um, however, what we know from the real world is that employees are often fighting to um, increase their value and employers are always also in, you know, fighting to, to get more out of their employees. Right? Like if we look at the pandemic, for example, um, we can see that, well, we can see that employers are expecting employees to, uh, to work more from home. Okay? So the government in this particular case, the Ontario government is now launching um, work from home policies and work-life balance policies. So policies that help and encourage employees to segment their work from their life. Okay? So with, again, to help protect employees because employees do have their rights. So when they're, yeah, what the Ontario government is suggesting is that employ employees have rights to um, have a life, if you will, outside of work. And that kind of idea, that kind of notion is it, somewhat new, um, but it's really been produced um, as a result of the pandemic, I'm sorry, as in response to the pandemic. Okay. Also within the legal framework class, we talked about discrimination. Okay, so discrimination was a, uh, a massive topic. It is a massive topic. Uh, and one of the things that I really want to highlight is that there's different forms of discrimination. There's intentional discrimination and unintentional discrimination. Uh, and I have definitions here. I want you to know the, the differences between the two of them. Um, one thing that uh, can be tricky at times is the notion of unintentional discrimination. Most people know what intentional is. So I'm going to go and I'm going to intentionally discriminate against you. Right? Like that kind of, I'm going to do something that puts you at a disadvantage over somebody else or, or you know, give somebody else an advantage over you, that kind of idea. So I'm going to, as a professor, I'm going to mark all of the men um, easier than all of the women in this class. And as a result, uh, that is a form of discrimination against women. Like that kind of idea. But unintentional discrimination is a little bit foggier. It's a little more challenging because it's not simply, uh, I am not simply discriminating against one person or a group of people. In many cases, that discrimination occurs um, indirectly or through the culture of the organization. Oftentimes it's embedded within the policy. So it's the idea that, um, so if I'm recruiting somebody, okay, so it's the idea that um, if I'm recruiting them to work at McDonald's, Okay. and height should not matter at all when, when it comes to hiring somebody at McDonald's. Um, but I can say, oh, you need to be at least uh, five feet tall or, or let's say five foot eight, eight tall to work at McDonald's. Hmm. So that's, that will discriminate against women because men on average are taller than women. But it's kind of embedded within the policy, it's embedded within the recruitment policy. So in some ways, that policy discriminate against women. So that could be a form of unintentional discrimination. Somebody just asked about explaining the difference between bona fide, a bona fide occupational requirement versus reverse discrimination. So a bona fide occupational requirement is probably one of my favorite uh, concepts for this particular class. Uh, I don't think I have one in the slide here, but uh, it's one of my favorites because all that it's saying is that you're legally allowed, the organization, the employer, is legally allowed to discriminate against a person or a group of people based on a legitimate business need. So again, that's why I stress this first slide, this whole idea that it's up to the employer. Based on legitimate business needs, employers can modify, can modify work terms. Well, the notion of a bona fide occupational requirement is based on a legitimate business need employers are allowed to discriminate against um, an employee. So a particular example would be, I mentioned throughout the class, is the, the idea of bus drivers, okay? Uh, so when you're, when you're working, you can't, um, so as a bus driver, you want to have a bus driver or a pilot uh, to be able to see. So a bona fide occupational requirement would be you are, requiring your employer bus drivers to have perfect vision or to have good vision, that kind of idea. So a bona fide occupational requirement is the, the requirement is to be able to see in order to drive this bus. 
because in other occupations, right, and so such as a, a professor, perhaps, you know, for example, or, or other computer-based uh, jobs, uh, vision might not be as important. Okay? So there wouldn't be that occupational requirement for a professor right, to be able to, to conduct their work versus uh, a bus driver. Okay? So that's why bus drivers would have a, a bona fide occupational requirement. Reverse discrimination is the idea that discrimination has occurred for years. So let's talk about the police services across Canada. So police services across Canada, as well as other industries, um, are, pre are predominantly white male. That is changing, but it's predominantly white male uh, working in those, in those particular jobs. Reverse discrimination would refer to efforts to um, to decrease the amount of discrimination that is currently taking place. So reverse discrimination would be the idea of uh, increasing efforts to hire uh, more women, okay? more women as well as more minorities in those particular cases. Uh, the other thing I want you to note when it comes to discrimination is there's so many different kinds of discrimination that take place. Okay? Here is a list of a few uh, but discrimination can take place on a whole host of different grounds. Okay? Many of these grounds are indicated in the, um, oh dear, the Human Rights Act. Okay? So ageism, classism, ethnocentrism, heterosexism, racism, the definitions are here. But it's, I just want you to hide, just, just keep in mind, note that discrimination can take place in many different forms. Some are here, some are not. You know, there are others that, are, that exist as well. But it's the idea that you're giving preference or, or providing a disadvantage to an individual or a group of person based on one of these grounds. Okay. We're flying on the third lecture right now, okay? organizational culture. Uh, so for me, this is, if you don't remember anything else about organizational culture, this is the slide to know. This is the metaphor to know. Okay? So it's all about the idea that organizational culture is like an iceberg. Okay? It's the most classic metaphor. It's the idea that like an iceberg, when, you know, when the Titanic was gone, okay, sailing across the top of the ocean, they could see a little bit of the ice on top. Okay? However, the majority of the iceberg, okay, the big weight of it is underneath the water. That's the same premise for culture. Okay? So in culture, when you walk into an organization, sure, you can see how some employees are interacting. Sure, you can see uh, the structure of the buildings, is it, are there offices, are there cubicles, or is it open concept? Sure, you can see that. But what does that represent? Okay? What have motivated, what are driving, what is driving those behaviors? And what is driving the creation of the workspaces in that manner? Okay? It's really everything that's taking place under the water. It's the norms, it's the assumptions, it's the values. What is important to that particular organization? So for example, okay, um, for example, uh, throughout the pandemic, many, uh, many companies have had offices empty for the past two years. So many employees that were working in the offices were forced to work from home or were forced or given the option to work from home, in many cases, of course, for a long period of time. Okay? So many of these organizations had empty offices for two years. Now, these uh, executives associated with these companies are trying to think of, well, what can we do to these empty offices? We're not simply, we've learned that there's value in people working from, we've learned that our employees want a hybrid workplace. We've learned that employees want to work from home. So we're not going to always just force them back to that. So now we have these empty offices. What can we do to these empty offices? How can we repurpose these to provide the most value to our organization? Okay. So based, largely driven by the values of the organization will dictate what will happen to those empty offices. So it's the idea that Okay, are we going to turn these into hoteling spaces and simply, you know, if we value cutting costs, okay, we're going to get rid of the offices. If we value cutting costs, we might get rid of half of the offices and half are uh, you know, turning to hoteling spaces. Okay? Uh, if we value uh, innovation, we might turn these empty offices, kind of remove the walls between them and turn them into like innovation labs, right? Hubs that people can come get together, come together. Okay? Yeah, if we value uh, collaboration. We might turn these into uh, a series of different boardrooms 
that teams can come together and collaborate, you know, think outside the box, right? So largely the, the values will dictate what artifacts are created and how people behave in the workplace, okay? So again, culture is like an iceberg, okay? What we can see, feel, and touch, okay, is only a small piece of what organizational culture is really, truly all about. Okay. Uh, now, employee engagement. For me, employee engagement is one of my favorite concepts. I've studied a bunch in terms of employee engagement. Uh, I think one of the things I, I like about it and don't like about it at the same time is that it's so well, it's kind of a buzzword right now, okay? So everybody knows everything. Everybody's an engagement expert. Everybody knows that in order to increase engagement, or everybody knows that, everybody knows that to increase that in employee engagement, a okay, work engagement, employee engagement, uh, leads to positive outcome, okay? It's so good. It's because when you're completely uh, enthralled in your work, time passes, time flies by. You know, think about the idea of, when you're ever, have you ever watched like a movie? Okay, you're watching a movie, you're loving the movie, you're completely into the movie, you're so zoned in, somebody's trying to talk to you and you can't even hear them, right? It's not that you're ignoring them, it's just you can't even hear them because you're so zoned in, you, you know, forgetting about the rest of the world. Or it's the idea that um, when you're doing something you really enjoy, like for me, I like skiing, okay? So I go skiing on the weekend, and you know, within seconds, I feel like the entire ski day is over. Like, Holy smokes, where did that go? That's because I'm completely engaged in that particular task, whether watching the movie or skiing. So employee engagement is all about that. When you can, can put all of your focus into a particular task, one, uh, the you know, time flies by, two, you're supposed to, you're, you're able to better perform your, your task because you have fewer distractions. Um, you're less distracted by the distractions and leads to a whole host of positive outcomes, which are displayed on the right. Okay? Um, on, the, on the same token, uh, in, in order to, affect employee engagement in the organization, there's two big factors, job resources and job demand. Job resources increase employee engagement. It's a bit of more of a, a transactional approach. Okay? So it's the idea that as a resource, as an employer, as an organization, as a manager, I am going to give the employee resources. And in reciprocation, the employee is going to give me their engagement. Okay? Or as a student-professor relationship, that kind of idea, I'm going to give you a textbook, okay? the textbook is a resource, and in return, you're going to read the textbook and utilize the textbook to learn more about this class. If I didn't give you the textbook as one less uh, tool that you could use to learn from me in this particular class, okay? or, or slide deck or something along those lines, if I didn't have this review class right now, it would give you less of an opportunity to engage in this material. And by engaging in this material, you're hopefully going to be learning something, that kind of idea, okay? So job resources positively relate to employee engagement. Now on the flip side, job demand, okay? Job demands negatively relate to employee engagement. The whole premise historically from job demands is the notion that job demands are straining. Okay? Think of, uh, think of you know, anytime you've worked or had a, like, a really difficult day, you've interacted with different customers and they just completely taken all your personal resources. You're just like got it, you're just exhausted uh, at the end of the day. Or maybe you can think of it something as simple as like, uh, say you're playing soccer okay? and your position involves a lot of running. <laughs> you're just going to, you know, versus somebody who's like involves a lot of standing. Right? Now, I don't want to say, I don't play a lot of soccer, so I don't know, but you know, if I was comparing it with you know, forward in soccer versus a goalie, okay? a goalie's you know, they, they stand more. So I'm, assu I'm assuming it's not as demanding. Uh, I guess many goalies would probably challenge me on that. Um, but, but as a goalie, you're, you're standing, right? And, you know, maybe go back and forth and shuffle a little bit and jump, jump you know, but, you, but you're standing versus a forward in soccer that's doing a lot of running, okay? That running would represent a very demanding component of your job, which would consume resources and the fewer resources you have, the less resources you can use to engage in a particular task. Okay. So in terms of like a, a work setting, uh, if, you, if you're a shoe salesperson and you're dealing with all customers that are very positive and just you know, dealing with adults, they ask you for, to try on one pair of shoe and then they buy it. It's not a very demanding environment. You contrast that with, say, you're um, a shoe salesperson at like a kid's store. Okay? There's going to be kids screaming all around you. Each kid's going to want to try on five or ten different shoes. Uh, after trying on five or 10 different shoes, they leave them all over the place. Nah, they don't like them. And that could be a very demanding, negative interaction if, you know, 
and as a result, it would consume a lot of your resources, and which would prevent you or challenge you from engaging in your work tasks. And just because simply you have fewer resources to give to this engagement, to, this, to these tasks. Okay? So traditionally, job resources positively, they increase employee engagement, and job demands negatively relate to uh, employee engagement, or they decrease employee engagement. Now, I do want to highlight one caveat. More recently, people have identified different types of demands. Okay? There's hindrance demands and challenge demands. Uh, and it's really highlighting the idea that not all demands are bad. Okay? There's some demands that, are, you know, they're, they're still straining. They're not that bad. Okay? So hindrance demands are demands that, you know, traditionally, they're just bad. Okay? So there's always going to be demands or elements of your work, of your job, uh, that are draining. Okay? Well, like dealing with, you know, like dealing with uh, customers, the shoe customers, let's go on the shoe, let's stay down the shoe analogy. Um, it's like dealing with, um, when you're in shoe sales, if you're going to be taking a bunch, bunch of boxes, trying to present shoes for people to buy, uh, and nobody buys them. Ah, you did all that work, and perhaps you don't get the commission. Okay? Shocks, right? Darn. Okay? But at the same time, you might have a challenge demand. Uh, you might get an opportunity to act as store manager for a day. Wow, that's a bunch of uh, additional responsibilities. It could be, a, you know, those additional responsibilities could be, a, could be demanding, but at the same time, that could be enriching and lead to growth. Okay? And that enrichment and leading to growth could prompt you to get more engaged in your particular task. You say, oh, wow, this is a killer opportunity. I've always wanted to do this. Sure, it's going to be a lot of extra work. I might have to stay a little bit later. It's draining. But then at the same time, I can say, wow, you know, I get to do something that I haven't done before. I get to learn. Uh, if, I, if I do really good at you know, acting as store manager, for I might get the opportunity to be an assistant manager or a store manager. So like, you get all excited. Though. You get more energy to put into your work. So even though the notion of taking on a new task, okay, acting as store manager, might be draining because the learning curve, your excitement associated with that new task might actually allow you to engage more in that task. And so there's a growing idea that there's two different types of demands, right? and some demands can increase engagement. Uh, the last component of this class, we talked about health and safety. Okay? Uh, within, and there's a whole host of different health and safety uh, issues and concerns across Canada. But the one that I want you to take away, the concept I want you to take away the most from that particular class was the idea as to what causes accidents. Do you guys remember? Was there, do you guys remember what causes accidents? How can an accident occur? That's right. So the, a type of person, uh, so somebody just said uh, a young person. Young people are more likely to um, have accidents, to, to, to become, to get injured. Uh, young, younger people are more likely to be injured than older people. Yeah, for a whole host of reasons. Yes, absolutely. Such as in experience. Perfect. Um, but let's think broader. Okay, so the type of person uh, that inexperience might lead to um, them behaving in a way that's unsafe. Okay, good. But Yes, you guys are providing specific examples, and, and you're absolutely right, lack of training, but but Quan's actually got it. That, this is where we, we have to think high level, okay? When we're talking about accidents on the exam, when, I, when I'm talking about, when, when I give you a question that's related to health and safety and anything that's related to an accident, I want you to think high level at first, okay? How can, why does an accident occur? There's three main reasons why an accident occurs, okay? There's a chance occurrence, the force measure, it's weather. You know, I'm driving a car, and all of a sudden it starts raining and ice and there's like hail and it starts, you know, the road starts freezing, lots of chance occurrence. You know, I couldn't have predicted the weather to, to change all of a sudden. Uh, and as a result, I'm not at fault. Nobody else is at fault, uh, but an accident can still occur. Weather, bad weather can still influence or can still increase the likelihood of an accident. Okay? So chance occurrence, something that is beyond everybody's control, unless of course you can control weather. Okay? Unsafe conditions. Okay, unsafe conditions. Unsafe conditions are another big one for why accidents occur. 
unsafe condition might be related to uh, old equipment, improper equipment, uh, the way that something is stored. So if you're thinking about, uh, let's think about like um, when you're in a different, I don't know, clothing store, so in the back, uh, shoes or clothes are stored right up to the ceiling. Uh, if it's not stored and secure in boxes, those boxes might tip over, right? And they might tip over and then they might like, you know, land on you, that kind of idea. So, you know, storage, uh, illumination, bad lighting, a ventilation. Uh, so it's the, the notion that um, if you're working in a confined space and there's poor ventilation, um, you know, aerosol, the particles might get into your lungs and more likely to, to get you ill. Or in, in, you know, in the case of COVID, uh, many universities uh, across Canada, uh, probably across the world, have ramped up their ventilation in between classes to try to, I don't know, put, you know, take bad air out of classrooms, right? In between classes and put good air, clean air right, inside the classroom so that people don't have to worry about, um, you know, initially when they were when they were in those environments, they would catch COVID from, a, from one of the individuals in the prior class. Right? Uh, unsafe condition could be the job itself, okay? So a police officer uh, might be, you know, it might be deemed that some of the tasks that a police officer does is just unsafe in comparison to some of the tasks that you know, a professor does. Right? Like that kind of idea. So I'm currently sitting behind a computer talking versus a, a police officer might uh, be working overnight. Okay? So they might have, they might be a little more fatigued, or they might be working in environments that are darker, or they might be working in environments where uh, where crime is present. Like right? that kind of idea. And then the last piece is this notion around unsafe action. Okay? So this is where, you know, to speak to the one comment about um, if somebody's inexperienced, yeah, their inexperience might lead them to acting in a way that is inappropriate and unsafe. Okay? So somebody who is younger, you know, and I don't want to beat up only on the younger folks because there's you can be any age who still um, take on unsafe actions. So such as somebody's carrying or lifting something that's too heavy. In this case, somebody, you know, you're moving something or some or someone, I guess, a, you know, depending on what you're, maybe you're a lifeguard or, or you're, a, you know, you work for the fire department, and, I don't know, moving somebody in that case. Uh, in any case, uh, if you're moving a box that's just too heavy, okay, uh, you might not intentionally be trying to perform an unsafe action for goofing around safe, uh, but if you lift something that's too heavy, well, you could pull out your back if you're not lifting, if you're not. Uh, using the proper gloves, for example, you might hurt your hands and that kind of idea. So if you're performing an action that's unsafe, that could lead you to um, getting injured on the job as well. Okay. Okay. So on the exam, what, what, if, I, if I would ask something along these lines and I'd say, hey, here's a case that's this how somebody got injured, okay? um, what caused the accident? I want you to consider these three high-level bullets. Okay? Consider these three high-level bullets first and then dive into specific examples as to if somebody was like uh, running and they tripped on ice, okay? You could say um, the unsafe action, okay? What was running at the workplace, okay? But say first that there was an unsafe action, right? So I know based on theory, you know what you're talking about, okay? And then give me a specific example. They were running on the workplace. Uh, so their operating speed was inappropriate. It was an unsafe action and that led to them tripping. Okay. But at the same time, this ice running example, you could say, hmm, well, maybe there was also unsafe conditions, right? So it's this notion that um, the ground should have been salted. There should have been salt on, on, on the road or on the pathway sidewalk that would have prevented somebody from sliding and tripping, okay? So okay, there was an unsafe condition, and that unsafe condition was associated with uh, the lack of salt or the procedures associated with salt in the pathways. In front of the store. Uh, somebody asked if we provide accidents that aren't on this list, but it is an actual accident, do we still get the mark? I don't think I completely understand. Uh, so the question, so I, on an exam, I'm going to be giving you uh, an accident. Okay, I'm going to be saying here, um, and here, here's an accident. What type of what led to this accident? In order to ensure that that accident doesn't happen again, so you're going to be providing uh, the different reasons why something might have occurred and what you can do to 
decrease the chances of that accident occurring again. Okay, is that, uh, is that clear? Next uh, job announced. How's the speed, by the way? Can somebody give me a little comment on speed? I, uh, I don't know whether I'm going too fast. I, I feel like I'm shifting topics pretty quick, but um, we have a lot to cover in this class. It's okay. All right, thank you. Thanks for the, thanks for the welcome. One person. <laughs> um, okay, so that's in the job analysis. But so job analysis. Job analysis is like super, for, um, super fundamental. It's all about... If you remember, it's all about collecting. It's a systematic way to collect information using that information for a whole host of different reasons that provides value related to many of the different topics we talked about in this course. Um, and like any of the processes, I, I actually show the process here. So here's the process that um, to follow when you're doing job analysis. I'm highlighting this process because I want to. I just want to highlight that I think processes are very important. Okay, particularly on the exam, it's, you need to fundamentally understand the steps associated with each one of these topics. Okay, so for example, job analysis. Here are the six steps in order to conduct job analysis. If you don't know what these six steps are at a high level, it's quite difficult to understand how step three, for example, relates to step four, which relates to you know, perhaps step two. Okay, so how does reviewing relevant background information provide a base, or provide a transfer point that's helpful in understanding how to select jobs. Okay, so you know, just to look at those two in exam for example, background information might be related to understanding whether your organization, not the job at this point, the under, understanding the organization, is it private sector, is it public sector, is it a not-for-profit? Um, if we're talking about McDonald's, it might be really important to uh, how many Big Macs can we make? You know, right? Like that's the purpose. We want to make more Big Macs, right? That's the goal of McDonald's versus the goal of a police service might be to um, keep communities safer. Maybe it's uh, arrest, you know, I don't want to say arrest, but that's a, that's a stereotype. Um, keep communities safer or hospitals, okay? Uh, hospitals to improve patient care and okay? decrease wait times. These might be important goals for the organization which provides background information. Or, or alternatively, say you're dealing with another private sector organization, but this particular organization cares tremendously about their employees, okay? So sure, it's private sector, it wants to increase and make more money, right? It needs to have, it wants to have a higher profit, but at the same time, that they're caring towards their employees and their culture about being people first might mean that when you're conducting the rest of your job analysis, you're not simply trying to look for ways to increase the bottom line or decrease the bottom line profit, you might be saying, hey, how can we improve the welfare and well-being of the employee? And so that background information is very helpful, and that might lead to or might influence what jobs you're going to analyze. Okay? If, for example, you find that you know, this, this organization, which cares tremendously about their employees, wants to put people first, there's a department in the organization that's hmm, perhaps a little more toxic, it's not as friendly as the others. Well, maybe the importance of that background information, that importance of culture, people first, might drive you to select certain jobs that are um, critical or might span towards other departments, uh, might be critical to, uh, to um, sharing the culture in that particular organization. Okay, so the background information feeds to help you select the jobs to be analyzed. And then once you select the jobs, you're collecting data related to those specific jobs. Okay? And if I remember correctly, uh, here are the different forms of data collection you can have for job analysis. Before I talk about these, there's a couple of comments. Uh, do you think we'll have more than enough time to finish the exam? The short answer ones are <laughs> kind of stressing me out. Um, can you hold on one second, please? My cleaner just arrived and my dog is going to go crazy. <laughs> so uh, hold on one second and I will be right back. Okay, so uh, the one question is, do you think we'll have more than enough time to finish the exam? The short ones are kind of stressing out time-wise. Um, well, we're gonna go through a bunch of old exam questions at the end of this class. 
so hopefully they don't stress you out too, too much. Um, there's 40 multiple choice, 10 true, false, and five short answer questions. Short answer questions have multiple components to them. Um, I think, I hope, you know, throughout the term, I've provided old exam questions in every lecture. Uh, I've put up uh, an old practice midterm and final for you to study from, and we're also going to be coming some today. So hopefully, uh, they will decrease your stress. I, I don't think that it will ever eliminate your stress. A a in fact, if you walked into the final exam and you weren't stressed a little bit, I think that's something that's off, right? So a little stress is good, um, but hopefully it just doesn't impede your ability to, uh, to remember key, key, bonus, uh, key, key facts and terms and concepts, as well as to uh, articulate them well. Uh, does grammar matter? Um, I'm looking for point forms. I'm not looking for essays. There's no essay questions. You don't have to worry about you know the hamburger, <laughs> hamburger essays. Um, somebody else asked, uh, going back to the accidents, what I mean is if I don't provide the accidents listed during the lecture, but actually just going to read it to them. Um, yeah, so if in throughout the course, there are so many different accidents and so many different you know, examples, uh, I certainly haven't provided a comprehensive list in any of my lectures. Uh, so if you can think of an example, a relevant example that I didn't say in class, 100% you'll get the marks for it. Um, absolutely. Uh, there will be 40, somebody's asking about short answer questions again, and there's 40 short answer, or sorry, 40 multiple choice, 10 true, false, five short answer, okay? Five short answer. <laughs> somebody asked, are we still getting those math questions? <laughs> yes, you will still get those math questions. But the way I structure, but the way I have it is there's, um, there's uh, 12 chapters, okay? And I made a short answer question for each of those 12 chapters. So you only, you know, based on the random pool, you're only getting five of them. So sure, you could get a math question. You know, and if you like math, it should be easy for you, um, but you might not as well. Okay, so it's you know, your 50% chance, flip of a coin, whether you get the math question. Okay. Uh, all right, so collecting data, collecting data for your job analysis. What I want you to know is there's a variety of different ways that you can collect data. Okay? One is not necessarily better than the other. What I would highly recommend is you triangulate and collect multiple forms of data. Okay? Because while an interview might be able to be, might be good and that provides you really rich information uh, about a particular job, uh, it is somewhat respondent bias in that people can lie and where people might not know what they're talking about. It might lead them to answering a particular way that might not provide you the most uh, objective or factual information. Uh, observations, you know, in contrast, um, don't allow for respondent bias because it's the observer is watching. It's very difficult for, for you know, somebody you're observing to, to lie when you can actually see their behaviors. Um, instead, observer observations are you know, limited by observer bias. And okay? so if I was observing, it's based on what I, what I see and what I can interpret based on your behaviors. I can't see the motivations for how you're behaving. I just simply see your behaviors. Okay, so, so any, each of these forms of data collection are limited. So using, you know, relying on multiple different forms of data uh, is definitely going to produce a stronger product when you're analyzing your job. Uh, so somebody's asking about doing another math example. I believe we do have one today. Um, I'm just going to speed this up, uh, the review of the actual concepts, because I think people just want to get to the, the questions. Um, this slide, you know, when we talk about HR planning, this slide is what I think to be the most important. Okay, so it's the whole idea of a bathtub. HR plan is it's like considering uh, your an organization is a bathtub. Okay. If you want more, if you, um, you know, think about how you change the water level in a tub. Okay? If you want to increase the water in a tub, you plug the drain and you open the tap. Okay? More water comes in, less water goes out, and the water level rises. Okay? If you want the water level to decrease, you open the drain and you stop the tap. Okay? The water level decreases. The same kind of idea in an organization in the number of employees you have. Okay? 
if you want to increase the number of employees you have, you, uh, you plug the drain, you discourage people from leaving the organization and you start hiring, hiring more people, the number of employees increases. Okay? Uh, and if you want the number of employees in the organization to decrease, you encourage people to leave the organization or you fire them, you lay them off, um, encourage them to leave, and you stop hiring people, people entering the organization. And there's a variety of different mechanisms for, for like that, that tap of people coming in. So the tap is just uh, think about it in terms of like recruitment, okay? recruitment, uh, you're, you're paying people more right, to incentivize people to come more. Um, wh where you're recruiting from, your efforts associated with recruiting. Uh, so in a COVID sense, a lot of organizations have had trouble retaining employees. So they've really increased their recruitment efforts. Again, trying to push, trying to get more people into the organizations. So what they're starting to do, some organizations are actually paying people to be interviewed for jobs, to incentivize them to participate in the interview and participate in the selection process. Hmm. Others are looking more broadly and saying that, okay, you no longer have to work on site. You can now work uh, virtually in this particular organization, or you can have a hybrid workplace. Or, you know, so there's different mechanisms to, again, to funnel more people into the organization. Now, on the flip side, this whole drain perspective, um, how can organizations encourage people to leave? Well, they can offer uh, earlier retirements. Okay? They can simply lay people off. They can downsize. Okay? They might... Um, you know, they might just, you know, one, they might stop hiring people and they just over time as people are retiring, they slowly leave the organization. So that's more of an attrition perspective where water, where the water level, where, where the number of employees in the organization is going down slower. Okay. So that's the one, that's the big key thing I want you to think about when, when we talk about HR. Okay. And I also want you to know that there are different perspectives and different techniques in order to to figure out ways in which, okay, so what's the demand and what's the supply for employees for next year? Okay? There's different techniques. I'm not gonna talk about them right now. I just want you to know that there are different techniques. And people are talking about the math question. The ratio analysis does refer to the, that math question. Okay? So it's just talking about recruitment. How do you recruit to get more people interested in applying for a particular job? Well, there's two main avenues for recruitment. There's recruitment within the organization and recruitment outside the organization. So if we have, uh, you know, think of, think of Ryerson. Okay? So think of Ryerson. It's a big organization. If we're going to, uh, there's recently, uh, they're hiring, they're looking to hire uh, an associate dean in TRSM. Okay? Uh, the first thing they're doing is they sent out a job description, a job ad to all faculty, tenured faculty within in the university, okay? does anybody within want to want to have this, want to, want to apply for this particular job? Okay? Can anybody give me uh, what's a pro, what's the benefit of applying or recruiting from within the organization? Why do organizations typically apply within first? Yeah, so the employees already know how the company works. There's this notion that there's somewhat of a, a person, I wouldn't say person job, a person company fit, I mean, um, possibly a person location fit. So, you know, you already like the location, you like the city, you like the company, you like the organization. Um, so you don't have to worry about that as much. Another big plus is often is that sometimes um, it could be considered a benefit or a perk to being uh, employed in that particular organization. Okay, so it's the idea that, okay, uh, Google, for example, is tremendously famous from recruiting and promoting from within. So it's the idea that if you start working at Google, it really doesn't matter where you start working, you know, high, low in Google. Once you get in, then you're given more opportunities to apply and promote and work your way up in the organization, that kind of idea. So not only does uh, recruiting from within help you um, in terms of a fit for a particular job, as well as you know, you know, you might know their other manager, you can reach out to them and get references that way. So it might help on like an individual basis, but also it could be perceived as a benefit of working for that organization that you know that organization tends to recruit from within first. Good. Uh, and outside, just on the flip side, um, while some of those advantages don't exist, from, uh, in contrast to the within side, outside, there's just so many more people. Okay, that's like 
massive benefit from recruiting outside. The idea that there's just so many people, uh, so many possible applicants that you could tap into, so many new skill sets, that diversity of perspectives really depends on what you're looking to add to a particular team or, or kind of hired for a particular job. Um, so recruiting from outside is it's not better or worse than recruiting from inside. It's just it results in a different, very different outcome. Already an hour in. Um, organizational socialization. So here's we're talking about onboarding. Okay? So the whole orientation and onboarding. Um, socialization is all about embedding organizational values. So it's the idea that when you're new to a particular role, new to a particular organization, uh, socialization is the process in which you think in order to become completely immersed and emerged into a particular role. How long does it take you to completely uh, accept and understand the organizational values? How long does it take you to start behaving in a way that's aligned to your new role? And that's what socialization is. How long does it take for that transition to occur? So when you were a high school student, you know, for many of you, your first year university students, so how long did that take for you to stop acting like a high school student and start acting like a university student? For some of you, right, that might have occurred very quickly. You might have been ready. You might have just adopt, accepted and adopted those behaviors and values right away. Okay, now, now I get it. But for some of you, you might still be struggling. You might still be acting like a high school student. And that's not good or bad. I'm not trying to say anything negative by it. Just you might not have um, had a good socialization process. Uh, you might be fighting against it. You might be um, just not believe that, you know, whatever host of reasons. Um, a socialization is just about the idea that you're immersing yourself into a particular uh, organization or role, you're adopting the values and accepting the behaviors. Um, the steps on the bottom are the, the three stages or the three steps in order to. Um, go through the socialization process. And again, you'll, you'll remember from class, we talked about this notion of hazing. Um, again, what is hazing? Remember for the final exam, as well as what stage in the socialization process will it occur in? Uh, and I just have a, you know, a news article saying that this is, this is a relevant um, topic. Okay? It's a relevant concept uh, where people today uh, are still getting hazed and they're still getting hazed. Uh, and it's an issue that we need to, as a society, we need to overcome a little bit. Not a little bit, a lot of it. <laughs> uh, training. Okay, so training, uh, this is one of the, the you know, key slides I want you to take away from the whole training, the training class. It's the idea of here are the, the key training techniques. There's many different ways to train employees. Okay. And here are the big ones that we talked about in class. So I want you to know what they are. I want you to one, know that there's different training techniques available. I want you to consider when you would use each one. Okay? And, and would you limit your the training of employees to just one technique? Or would you try to layer somebody's learning over top of one another? So for example, in let's just stick to the university setting. So classroom training is you know, like we are doing right now is this whole notion you're trying to teach somebody you, know, you have a lecture you have some, you know, somebody teaching an instructor who's supposed to be highly trained in a particular area and they're leading a class you might have exams tasks assignments to, to help reinforce this learning but at the same time you might have a little bit of on-the-job training so if you're in co-op for example that could be deemed on the job training so or an apprenticeship or an internship so it's the idea that universities that offer co-op they offer both the classroom training, but they also provide a little bit of on-the-job training. And if anybody's had work experience, you can see there is some overlap between classroom learning as well as on-the-job learning. And sometimes they're completely distinct, okay? Um, so again, if you're an organization and managing you're offering different forms of training techniques, it is always preferable to have multiple different forms of training techniques. Because one, certain techniques appeal more to, to uh, employees than others, but also um, what uh, is trained and what is possibly to be learned from each of these techniques varies. And so again, provide multiple different training techniques. Okay. Uh, then we also talked about performance management. Okay. So performance management is all about the idea, how do you uh, motivate 
or manage somebody's performance. Okay, we talked about performance management in terms of carrot and the stick. Performance management is more of the stick idea. How can you um, evaluate somebody's performance and then provide them feedback on that performance in a way that motivates them and encourages them to behave in a particular manner? This slide reflects the notion that here are the traditional formal appraisal methods. Here are the methods that you can use to evaluate somebody's performance. Okay? There are different forms, different methods. In an ideal world, you could use multiple of these methods. In an ideal world, you would have multiple people evaluating every single way. In reality, it doesn't happen because we don't have the time and resources to do so. Um, but I want you to know that there's different forms of uh, formal appraisal methods that take place. And I also want you to know why would you use one of these approaches over another? And so if I were to provide a case in a specific example, why would you use uh, a force distribution or the pros and cons of that over uh, a critical incident approach, for example? Um, employee rewards. Okay, so the thing that I, the big thing I want you to take away from employee rewards uh, is like the fundamental idea as to why rewards motivate employees. And again, I talked about this during class. Reward, rewarding, you know, rewarding. Why do organizations reward employees? It's the same idea as to why people reward dogs. And it sounds fundamental, but it's pretty straightforward. Okay, so I got my dog Looney here, you know, sitting there just hanging out. And I offer her human food, and she jumps up right away. Okay, so I reward my dog for a particular behavior. So it's the idea that if I want her to sit, she comes and sits, I reward the behavior, okay? It's that same kind of idea in an organization. In an organization, we re organizations reward employees for a particular type of behavior. We want them to engage in a particular task, perform, you know, develop a particular outcome, and when they do so, we reward employees, okay? We might, and how we go about rewarding them um, yeah, there's a variety of different ways. And you can think about it in terms of like rewarding your dog too, right? Do you, uh, you know, do you give them multiple little treats each time they sit or do you ask them to sit multiple times and then give them one big treat? Right? The way in which you reward employees uh, will influence their behavior, will influence how quickly they, be, they, they change and adopt certain behaviors. And so how we reward and how we compensate employees is very, very important. Okay. Uh, in line, you know, it, this is in line with you know, the way in which you can compensate somebody just speaking to the notion of incentives. Okay. So it's uh, incentives go above and beyond the base pay to stimulate a little greater of an output. But it's the idea that uh, if I'm I just receive a salary. If I just receive base pay, say I get hundred thousand dollars a year. Uh, if I work fifty percent, I still get a hundred thousand. If I work seventy-five percent, I get hundred thousand. If I work one hundred and fifty percent of my effort, I still get a hundred thousand. So incentives universe um, to say that hey, if you give that extra, you're likely to receive a little bit extra in terms of compensation. So if I give one hundred and fifty percent, I might get you know, an additional 10,000 or something like that on, on top, right? So incentives stimulate greater uh, output because you're motivated for that extra incentive. And that incentive and in pay is associated with a particular effort or, or output. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're going to, let me pause this real quick. All right, so I started the recording again, all right. Uh, so the first topic, first question I'm going to have is related to the understanding labor relations. Okay, so this is a typical question for me related to this particular topic. So one, your friend just became an ML elementary school teacher in Ontario, and as such, has joined the Ontario Teachers Union. She has not worked in a unionized environment before. Uh, Victoria, yes, five short answer questions. Uh, so part of this case, okay, this union, teachers union case, there are three key components. So first off, again, when you're looking at this little, you know, in this case, it's like a two-liner case, okay, I want you to think, how many times have I used the word union, <laughs> you know, working in a union, unionized environment, I want you to think about when I, as soon as I have this case, you should know what slides to pull up from me, you should know where you're zooming your attention into, 
It's the whole idea of union. Okay. So again, pull you pull up the side deck associated with union and then go from there. Okay. Describe three ways how unions can help their employees. Okay. So there was Sabrina, so just to make sure point form was yes. Sabrina, don't overthink it. Point form is fine. Okay. Um, so three ways you know, unions can help their employ their members. Okay. So I'm asking for three ways. And here I show you that it's worth three marks. So I'm not looking for you to do anything more than simply identify the three ways. Okay. Does anybody remember any way that a union can help their members? Benefits. Yeah, they fight for benefits. Good. A collective voice. Good to give them more of a voice out here. Okay. So um, benefits, absolutely. Uh, employee voice, yes, absolutely. So this is all simply from one slide. The fact that you guys already remember these is, is great, right? You're going to be already uh, ahead of the curve. You can write them down, but I would still recommend you go to the slide just so you have a whole host to step back up. But I guess one of the things that I want you to do is remember, if you remember what, it, you know, you pull up this, sorry. My question is about unions. One of the things I recommend first is that because it's virtual and because it's an open book exam, I encourage you to pull up the slides right away. And when it's talking about three ways unions can help their members, I want you to navigate to that slide that talks about all the ways that unions can help. Okay? You already know what they are because you're writing them down. So if you, you know for this particular question, you may not need to reference the particular slide, but if you don't, and that's one technique I'd recommend. Other than educators, moi, identify three other industries that commonly have unions. Okay. Postal service, yes, 100%. Uh, and again, there are no uh, specific answers I'm looking for. We talked about a bunch in class. Here's a couple of examples. Um, trades, nurses, postal service, those are all good. Okay. So it's just the idea that you can identify them. We talked about them in class, so you should know from, from class, but you don't have to limit your answers to what we talked about in class. Um, and then here, number you know, C, explain three reasons why people may not like working in a unionized environment. So this is a backwards way of asking, what are the negatives associated with unions? Okay? And I don't know why I, I asked for three reasons and I made this out of four marks. I apologize. I should have said, you know, two reasons. And then, you know, you would have given the reason and an explanation for it a little bit more. Okay. Um, but can anybody identify a negative associated with working in a union? Uh, bureaucratic, yeah. Long processes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, the fact that they, you know, the whole bureaucratic, they're slow to change, uh, can, go on, can go on strike. So you're losing pay if you don't want to go on strike. Your pay dues, yeah, absolutely refers to that high cost. Um, and another thing you can think about is the idea that while well, job mobility is increasing, the union promotes stability. So it doesn't really make sense. If you're one of those people that want to change jobs every five years, uh, the, you know, you're going to enter into a union. The unions really promote the notion of seniority. So the longer you've been a part of the union or the longer you've been a part of that organization, the more preference is given to you. But if you're always moving, if you're typically moving around every, every couple of years, that advantage of seniority is lost on you. So you'll be almost disadvantaged from moving around as much. That might not make as much sense. Yeah, so absolutely, your voice might not be valued as much. Um, so an example of that would be, uh, you know, I'll use it from a university perspective, or no, uh, I'll use a healthcare perspective or teaching. You now, any one of these would work, I guess, the idea. Um, so say, say you're a nurse and you've worked in, you know, in a particular hospital and you're part of this nurse's union for, um, you know, 30 years, you're going to be very senior. And as a result of being so senior, you're going to have more, um, not only say influence, more seniority in terms of scheduling your shifts and accepting and receiving opportunities for overtime shifts. Okay? But if you change after working 30 years in that hospital, say you shift and go to another hospital, you're a different part of the union. 
you're, you're a part of a different union, your seniority would go back down to the base. And as a result, you wouldn't get, you wouldn't receive nearly as many opportunities to work overtime. You wouldn't get as, nearly as many um, options in terms of scheduling your shift. Okay? So that's the whole idea of the more senior you are in a union, the more benefits uh, arise from being a part of it. Excellent. Uh, so number two, okay, so number two. Um, here, we're talking a little bit more about, uh, about turnover, okay? So you are a general manager at Sands, Sainsbury's, Sainsbury's, I don't know how to say, Sainsbury's, Sainsbury's, a grocery store in the United Kingdom. Recently, there have been declining sales. In order to maintain a profit, you are considering several different options for letting people go. Termination, layoffs, downsides. So describe each of these forms of involuntary turnover. Okay. So there's three forms and it's worth two marks. So I'm hoping you provide a sentence, a sentence or two, right? To justify, to describe each of these forms of turnover. Okay. Um, one thing I might suggest, at least from a definition perspective, is even differentiating between layoffs and downsizing. That's a key idea. Okay. So again, I won't ask you for this. I will just say, hey, here's one slide where we talked about it for differentiating the three. Okay, so terminating, termination is when somebody makes a mistake. There's a just cause. Again, it's not like a just cause, you're, let, you're getting let go. There was a just cause. There was a causal reason why somebody would have been terminated. Okay, the layoffs. Uh, are associated with uh, temporal financial pressures that result in temporarily letting people go and then bringing them back. The idea of in the airlines, for example, um, with the pandemic, uh, the pandemic has reduced the number of flight demand, reduced the demand for flights. So many airlines let people go, put them on furlough temporarily, right, with the notion that when demand for airlines picks up, they're going to bring those exact same people back. Okay? Downsizing on the flip side refers to permanent changes in an organization. Okay, so they're restructuring an organization. They are permanently uh, removing people from the organization with no intention on bringing them back. Okay, so that's how you would define. You could differentiate them that way. Okay, now part B is the trickier of the question. Okay, which of these approaches to involuntary turnover would you choose, and why? Okay. So while A, you could simply get from the textbook, or you could simply get from my slides, right? B, you could not, okay? So it, you have to provide a bit of a rationale, and it's four marks, so you're going to provide a little bit more than just simply, uh, I would select termination, okay? Uh, and you need to provide a rationale for it. Anyone want to take a stab as to what approach to involuntary turnover you would choose? Which one would you choose? There's declining sales. Maintain profit, you're considering letting people go. So downsizing because we can't afford them and we don't know if we will be in the future. We will be able to uh, in the future for a layoff. Uh, uh, somebody else says, Alexander, is there a right answer for B or is it based on how are we explain it? Uh, there is not one right answer. Okay? There's not one particular right answer. I would say there's a wrong answer, uh, but there's no one specific answer. There's definitely great. How well you articulate, how well you explain, how well you justify will definitely lead you to getting the four marks or not. Um, somebody else said downsizing because there's declining sales and you're not making profit, therefore to cut costs, you need to dismiss employees permanently. Um, yeah, it's kind of interesting. So I, I would say that, you know, these answers are, these answers are good. They're, they're going in the right direction. Um, but here, if we look right here, there's been declining sales. We don't really know whether this is a permanent or a permanent thing. We don't know why the, sales are declining. We don't know whether there's another massive 
you know, grocery store chain that has just been you know, opened in the United Kingdom. We don't know whether um, people have, you know, they don't like grocery stores and they're buying more things online from Amazon, right? We don't know whether this is a temporary decline or whether this is a permanent decline based on this particular question. Uh, so one approach would be to highlight that. And we don't know whether there's a, a permanent decline. We don't know whether there's a temporary decline. And as a result, we don't know currently whether down, whether you want a temporary solution or a permanent solution. Um, and then you could justify that, right? You could say, hey, if it's a temporary solution, if a temporary problem, then patch it with a temporary solution. If it's a permanent problem, then patch it with a, temp a permanent solution. Okay. You know, uh, so I say, you know, layoffs and downsizing. And I, you know, when I'm talking my TAs, I would say two marks for identifying one of those and two marks for explaining why. Right? And, and I guess I've talked about it right here. If you think that the decline in sales is temporary, well, you know, you can rehire the folks and uh, you only need a layoff and temporary and bring them back after you know, the, sale, the decline in sales has, has subsided. Uh, Sabrina is asking, can you lay somebody off without knowing if you'll hire them again or not? You can 100% lay somebody off if you don't know you're going to hire them again, um, except you're not going to be protecting their job. Okay? You can 100% lay somebody off, uh, or not lay somebody off. You can certainly, um, what, you know, from a definition perspective, you wouldn't say lay somebody off without knowing you're going to hire them again, at least based on you know, this course in the textbook. Um, but say you, um, dismiss somebody, right? You fire somebody, you dismiss somebody um, based on declining sales. Um, you can tell them, hey, if sales pick up, we might rehire you, but you're not going to protect their job. You're not going to promise them that they will be rehired or reissued employment um, when the decline sales is, uh, is over. And, and, you know, and this is like, you know, you, know, you have to think about the implications of this because if you're stringing somebody along, what would that lead to? Because if you remember from class, there was one slide where we talked about what's the likelihood of working for an organization again that has downsized you. I forget the exact stat, but I think it was two thirds of, of employees or, or victims of downsizing would not work for their organization that has let them go. So, okay, so keep that in mind. So if I'm temporarily letting, if, some, if I'm dismissing somebody, and, you know, they're not allowed to work because there's a decline in sales. Hmm, interesting. Am I likely to rehire them again? Right? So there's that, that kind of play out. Alternatively, one option, you know, I didn't include this as a particular option, but one thing to keep in mind more broadly speaking is perhaps don't even let people go altogether and perhaps say, hey, there's this decline in sales. You know, say a quarter of our sales are declined, so a quarter of our demand is now gone. We could either lay off or downsize a quarter of folks or we could simply keep everybody and pay people a quarter less than we currently are right so the idea that you retain your job security except you're, and you're going to be doing the same job you're just going to receive a quarter less pay with the intention that we're going to ramp that back up as soon as demand increases okay? so there are different strategies different approaches you could take when there are external changes right like declining sales factors that lead to declining sales um, you just want to consider them and the implications of that on your organization. Okay. Um, number three, you have recently been hired as a human resources director at Lululemon and the athletic leader clothing store in Canada. You have noticed that some stores are not meeting expectations for sales. You wonder whether these poor sales are the inadequate training of sales personnel in these specific stores. Okay. Uh, and then part A, B, C, D, okay. outline the objective of a needs analysis. Okay. Again, in your mind, if you're thinking, wow, I read this question, this is like a nightmare, this is a heavy one, this is gonna be one of these tough ones, I don't know sales, I don't know how to do. No, what are we talking about here? We're talking about training, okay? So again, pull up the slides associated with training. And in this particular case, the, slide, the, the class we talked about training was orientation training and developing input. This question looks specifically at training, okay? So we can ignore the slides, the other 
the other actual slides within this slide deck. Okay, focus specifically on training. Okay, go to the slide that says um, the steps in training, and then go to the, the first step in the training is, is identify um, the needs analysis. Okay, does anybody remember what the objective of a needs analysis is? Remember? No. It is um, is really to identify what needs to be trained. Okay? So the objective of a needs analysis is to separate what somebody can't do from somebody from what they won't do. Okay? And, and really to highlight you know, what they should be doing. Okay? So it's the idea that, hey, this is what you should be doing. And then here is what you what you're actually doing. Okay? And then when you talk about what you should be doing, what you're actually doing, and then what you're actually doing is can really be broken down into this idea that this is what you can do versus this is what you are not currently doing. Am I explaining? I don't think I'm explaining this well. So for example, um, uh, I work at a I work at Home Depot. Okay? I work at a permanent store. And one of the things I'm supposed to do is to keep the outdoor space clean. Okay. And some of this is in terms of uh, moving lumber around, moving you know, the garden section, moving that around, keeping things clean, okay? And in my mind, what I should be doing is keeping it clean to the standard of, you know, what's written in the job description or the standard of the manager, okay? Now, as an employee, I might not just have the ability, I might think that something is clean when there's like, um, Plants that are unorganized, or I'm, not, I'm supposed to be putting plants that are color coordinated, but maybe I'm colorblind, right? So I'm trying to put plants uh, that are you know, color coordinated together, but because I'm colorblind, I can't do it. Okay. Mm. So in this case, my issue, one of the objectives of the needs analysis would be to say, hey, um, my issue is associated with how I'm organizing these plants to keep them color coordinated to make it clean and make the appearance good. However, what we find out from doing this needs analysis is that. It's not that I'm unwilling to do this. I want to work. I'm trying to do this. It's that I can't do it because of my physical ability because I'm colorblind. It's that kind of idea. So in that case, is there a training that could be done in order to fix it? Probably not because it's colorblind. Or maybe you uh, you would label certain plants with instead of a colors you would I don't know. I'd have to look at the tags or something like that, right? So that's the kind of idea. So objective of needs that's out needs analysis is to is to identify is to compare what people should be doing, what people are actually doing, and when you consider that actual component, you're separating what they can do versus they um, are are less willing to do. Maybe uh, you know, alternatively, it's not maybe it's not my vision. Maybe it's not just lazy. I'm like, ah, oh, the plants are over there; they don't have to be color coded. Like that kind of idea. Uh, explain task analysis and provide an example of how you might analyze the task. Okay. So in this case, I'm looking for a one-line explanation of task analysis and a one or two line uh, of you providing an example of how I might analyze the task associated with this particular case, okay? So again, in this case, um, some stores, Lululemon stores are not meeting expectations for sales. And you think that it's associated with uh, the training, inadequate training of sales personnel. Okay. So what's task analysis? Uh, task analysis is a breakdown of the tasks. I'm sorry. Let me... So task analysis is all about what people should be doing. Okay. Here's the task. You're breaking the job down into tasks. You might be uh, referencing um, performance standards or employee guides. Or, or textbooks on in terms of how employees should be acting, should be behaving. Okay? Uh, and the example is perhaps by referencing performance of employees at stores where they're meeting their targets. So in order to help identify the behaviors that people should be doing, um, you're referencing the performance, the sales, the activities, the behaviors of employees at stores that are meeting that sales target. So you're comparing the behaviors of employees at stores that are not meeting the targets the behaviors of those who are meeting their targets, okay? Or at least referencing the, the, the textbook or guides associated with that so they know exactly what they should be doing. 
Performance analysis, this is where you're looking at what people are actually doing. Okay, so it's this notion that you're, um, uh, you're comparing, you're looking at what, what mistakes people might actually be making. Okay, so you're not looking, you're not relying on textbooks or guides, you're relying on uh, what behaviors people are actually doing. Okay. So you're verifying any performance inefficiency. So maybe um, when, when it's going to sales, maybe you know, there's supposed to be a certain set of steps, one, two, three, four, five, when you're selling a product, and maybe they're skipping step two and three. Okay. So you'd identify that that's the performance deficiency. Okay. Uh, so perhaps you're assessing the behavior when interacting with customers. Okay. That might be how you'd go about conducting a performance analysis. And then part D, after conducting a task and performance analysis, what would be your final step to conduct whether training is required? The last step of the, okay, so all of this, to be honest, all step A, B, C, D is all related to a needs analysis. Okay, so a needs analysis is performing a task analysis, performing a performance analysis, and then part, part D, as you're putting the two together. You're comparing your task analysis to your performance analysis, and that will identify any gaps. Okay? So it's the idea that you're comparing what people should be doing based on the textbook or based on like what people should be following, the guides, versus what people are actually doing. Okay? So people should be, when they're selling a product, they should be following steps A, B, you know, one, two, three, four, five. What people are actually doing, they're doing one, two, or five, they're missing step three. So the gap analysis is you should be training step three, right? That should be what you're highlighting, right? And so it's the gap between the task analysis and the performance analysis. That's the, that's the key associated with a needs assessment. Any questions associated with that? We're quiet with that one. Okay, we got about 10 minutes to go. Ten minutes ago. Okay. Um, so number four, you are a manager at a small retail store. Several of your employees are constantly arriving late to work and treat customers before that. You are considering performance managing them. Okay. So A, please identify and explain three performance appraisal methods. Okay. So uh, it asks for three and it's worth six marks. So I'm looking for two lines associated with each method. Okay. Uh, we talked about this earlier today. There's also a slide associated with it, so I'm not going to dive into any great detail. Um, here I've listed them out. Okay, graphic rating scale, the alternation ranking. Here's an example of what it would look like. Uh, paired comparison, force distribution, critical incident. Again, I took these directly from the slides in our class, so you have them. But here's what they are, as well as their definition. And part B, the hamburger technique, one of my favorites. When delivering feedback, you plan to use the hamburger technique. Do you guys remember what the hamburger technique is? Now, I'd probably say two marks for describing the technique and two marks for describing why it's helpful. Does anybody remember what the hamburger technique is? I know I'm getting hungry. Hungry just asking this question. Good, bad, good. Two goods, one bad. Yeah, it, it, good, bad, good. Um, or if we want it to be more of a glass half full, it's positive feedback, uh, constructive feedback, and positive feedback again. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, so how does this work, right? Receiving positive feedback, uh, providing positive feedback at first encourages employees to listen to the negative feedback. So you hear positive feedback right from the get-go, you're more likely to, hmm, I know negative feedback is coming, but hey, this person doesn't think I'm so bad. So you're more likely to listen. Oh, are they going to provide me with more positive feedback? You, your ear opens a little bit more, so you're, you're more open to receiving critical feedback. When you hear something good about yourself, you're just more open to hearing something more critical as well. Okay? Then you're providing uh, the negative feedback or the more critical feedback. That's truly, in many cases, the real focus as to why somebody's providing feedback. Okay? Hey, this is what you should be doing differently. Okay? And then you also leave on a positive note by providing positive feedback at an end. It encourages people to leave on a happy note. They're more likely 
to uh, receive feedback from you again, knowing that you left on a positive note, and they're more likely to remember um, what you were talked about when you're leaving on a happy note, rather than just being upset with them and thinking it's a negative interaction. Uh, somebody, uh, somebody just wanted to highlight that in the slides, these are referred to as formal appraisal methods. Um, yes, so that's, I, I would say that those are it's, you know, synonymous when I'm talking about here, but I guess on that point is during the final exam, I will, uh, I will be available. I'm going to give a Zoom link to everybody. Um, and you can click on that link and talk to me anytime you want. Uh, it will be on an individual basis. Uh, you'll you'll be you'll come into a you know, a waiting room and I'll click on you and you can chat, come and chat with me. Uh, so it'll be on one on one. So if, for example, you're like, hey, this is asking about performance appraisal methods on the, the slide. They're talking about formal appraisal. Are they the same? Well, jump, click on the Zoom link, get on the call with me, ask me. I'll say yes, they're the same, and then you can go from there. So if you're ever worried about wording or some specific questions about, from the exams, feel free to, to you know, reach out to me during the exam. I will be available and I'll answer quite quickly. Okay, number five, uh, your, your manager at Zara clothing store is a strong culture and moderately priced products. Zara pays its employees minimum wage, even though their competitors pay their employees a little above minimum wage. So you're paying a little bit less than your competitors. Zara also offers its employees free Cineplex movie tickets and a monthly drop for concerts. You notice that you have a high number, high turnover at Zara, and that while everyone says they like movie tickets, no one is using them if there are no good movies in theaters. And I, feel, I think we might have talked about this one in class a little bit, but explain the difference between direct and indirect financial payments. So the one is um, direct. This is like, think about this in terms of cash, okay? There are things that you receive. This is cash. Is a wage? Is a salary? Is an incentive? Commission or bonus? So you are receiving this money. Okay? Then an indirect financial benefit or financial payment is think of it like a benefit. Okay? Are they like um, like a dental benefit? They help help offset the costs associated with uh, visiting a dentist. Are they uh, like a vision benefit? Is it like the idea that it's offsetting some of the costs associated with buying a new set of glasses? Okay? That kind of idea. Identify the direct and indirect financial payments at Zara. Okay, so here you're simply going through and identifying the direct versus indirect. Okay. So in this case, uh, Zara pays its employees a minimum wage. Okay. okay. So there's the one and it offers free movie cinema movies and a monthly drop of cost. Okay. That would be the indirect. Okay. So the one is cash, okay? minimum wage, those are cash, and the indirect, the benefits, would be movie tickets and a concert draw. Okay? Those are not cash. They're also, they could provide value to you, okay? but they are not cash. They're not money. Okay? And the last one, okay, again, two marks, two marks, these are relatively simple. And then here's the beefier component. Okay. Please explain what you do to improve the situation by modifying the employee reward. And when you're answering this question, I want you to think back to Luna, my dog. Okay, why do organizations reward employees the same reason that people reward dogs? Okay, you want more rewarding to entice a certain type of behavior. Okay, so in this particular case, you notice that there is high turnover going on. Okay, high turnover. This means that that is a behavior that you do not like. So your changes to the reward program should change that particular behavior, okay? So what could you do? Six marks, I would say, identify this behavior. This is the bad part that you're trying to change. And you're going to either provide either or, or uh, you know, direct and indirect financial payment, changes to either of those or changes to both of them. Since you're paying less than your competitors, one change would be to, to match your competitors or, or to, you know, to pay even more than your competitor. And that could reduce turnover, depending on where you're, you know, maybe your employees are leaving and they're just going to their competitors because they can make more money there. Alternatively, uh, 
people aren't using the movie ticket. Right? So maybe don't offer the movie tickets and maybe offer a different type of benefit than somebody else would want. Okay? What do people want? Well, ask them, figure out what, what it is that would motivate them to, to stay, what types of benefits they want. Okay? So identify the behavior they want to change, high turnover. Determine whether to adjust direct or indirect. People aren't using you know, the indirect perspective. People aren't using movie tickets. Um, so one thing you can do is collect the information, what they want, and then implement it in better thing. Other, I don't have it written here, but I do think it's also valid, is to pay people more. Because we know that you're paying people less than your competitors, people might be interested in to make more money elsewhere. Number six, you are a manager at a growing startup app developer. You believe that an office environment is very important for the type of creative work you do. You recently noticed that more of your employees are leaving work for your competitors who are paying them more money. Okay, so again, trend, turnover, leaving their set of competitors. When you're approached by your manager about increasing salaries, your manager could have stated that the salaries were not going to change. You consider an offer what benefits you can offer to employees to entice them to stay. Okay, so in this case, explain why employer-sponsored benefits may help you keep employees. Okay. So, so there's two types of benefits, uh, um, employer or voluntary and involuntary benefits. Okay. Employer-sponsored benefits is the same as voluntary benefits. These are things that employers might use to, or leavers and employers might use to encourage people to stay, not to stay, but just to improve their well-being. Okay. So they think of it like a benefit. Okay, so it's the idea that they benefits can make up for lower compensation. Sometimes they can, sometimes they cannot. Okay. You're considering offering employees a flexible work arrangement, explain three different flexible work arrangements. So in this particular case, this was the tricky question. You have to know what a flexible work arrangement is. Okay. So we, do, we did cover that um, in the class, but if you forget that, here is the list of them. Okay, so flex time. Uh, what, let's talk about telecommuting is the idea of you can working from home. Sometimes it's called teleworking, sometimes it's called teleworking, remote work, you can work from home. Flex time is the idea that you can come and go when you want, generally around a four seven hours. So maybe you have to be on site nine to three, right? 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. But whether you arrive at 7 a.m. and leave at three or whether you arrive at 9 a.m. and leave at 5 p.m., that gives you the flexibility in terms of when you can come and go, as long as you maintain those hours. So here's a list of different flexible work arrangements. And then the last one, which flexible work arrangement should you offer? This is a typo. This should be your app development. Okay, and why? Okay, so of those three, which ones are you more likely to, to uh, offer? Again, it should relate back to this story. Okay. Relating about pay, it's an app, so you, you, know, you can work virtually. Since it's an office environment, um, where are here? Sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to figure out what happened. Since office environment is important to work, okay. Uh, you'd be no teleworking. If, if the office environment wasn't as important, then you could offer teleworking. Okay, so you don't want to offer this. Uh, since you're growing, you probably wouldn't offer job sharing or work sharing because those are referring to situations where you be decreasing the headcount, decreasing the number of employees in an organization. So you would either offer flex time or flex work week. Again, there's not one right answer, but there are wrong answers. All right. Sorry that we're moving quickly. I just want to get through this uh, by the by the hour, and I want to make sure you see as many questions as possible. And, and again, um, I'm going to post these so you can review them. But uh, if you have any questions when looking at them again, I'm happy to answer them. Okay. Number seven: A petrochemical company based in Calgary is looking to become more international. As a first step, they're looking to recruit and select non-Canadians to work in their Calgary location. Okay. In, in A, an international brand is one of the four consideration 
companies should have when recruiting internationally. Okay? What are the other three considerations companies should have when recruiting internationally? So in this particular case, what I wanted you to do is there's one slide that talks about recruiting. So go to the international HR slide deck. There's one slide that talks about recruitment and look at that slide and there's four bullets. International brand was one of the four. So look at the other three. And so in this case, uh, I've included all four of them here. And so this is what I have related to each of those three. And B, uh, once the company has recruited enough job applicants, they need to select employees for the job. Please explain each of the four steps in the international selection process. Again, there was one slide that spoke to that. And here it is. Begin with the self-identification, create a candidate pool and ensure there's a person job fit and then a person location fit. And kind of uh, lumped in with this last person location fit is making sure there's a fit family. If you're going to be leaving countries, is there a language issue? Uh, is there training requirements required? Um, that kind of idea should all be considered in that step. Okay, here is the math question. And so I should have started with that because there are people have other questions about this. Okay, do you work at Blue Fruit Inc., a company that designs and makes cell phones and tablets? You have recently been promoted to sales manager and are reviewing sales figures before a major meeting. You notice that the demand for your leading cell phone uh, has been increasing as shown in the table below. And okay, there's the table. Based on the table below, explain whether you are likely to have a major a labor oversupply or undersupply okay, shortage at Blue Fruit. By two recommendations to address your labor oversupply or undersupply. Okay. Does anyone want to take a guess? Is there going to be an oversupply or undersupply? One technique that you can use to identify that is, is the average customers per month going up or is it going down? Since the customers are going up, that would suggest that you need a greater number of employees for next year, okay? which means Christian's correct. Right? There, you do not currently have enough. If the, the customer trend continues to increase, you do not have enough employees to match. As a result, you're going to need to get more. Okay? So absolutely. So there's a shortage. Okay? And then here are the different solutions. Right? There's internal solutions as well as external. You need employees to match the demand. So perfect, Christian, you got it. Now, part B, based on this information, if Blue Fruit is hoping to serve 224 customers over the next three months, so again, they're looking to serve the same number of customers, so it's staying static. And so we have it in May, June, July, August. Okay. How many employees will it need to add or remove in June, July, August to reach this target? So the trick here that, you know, that I haven't thrown at you previously is the idea that I'm not looking simply at the next month, I'm looking at the next three months. Okay. That stumbled a lot of people. They're like, what the heck? How does that make sense? Um, simply, if you follow the, the procedure, okay, do the ratio, you know, this column divided by this column equals the ratio, okay, you know that you're going to maintain the same number of months, okay, same number of employees, each one, it should be in August here, by the way, okay, you do this, and then you figure out what the average would be, and you retain that average will be the same year over year, or month over month. Okay. And then you divide, you know, the 224 divided by the average it gives you your 219. Okay. So that 219 would round up to the 220. And okay. in this case, it wasn't a very good example because uh, this number is the same as this number, which is you know, not as interesting. Um, and you always round up, even if this is below 0.5, because you can't have 0.4 of a person. And so always round up to 220. So in this particular case, you would hire no employees in June, hire no employees also in July and August. Okay. So a bit of a trick. I didn't mean to uh, make this a zero net gain, but I did in this case. And as long as you show the numbers, you have no problem. Part C, uh, assuming there's a turnover of five employees per month, how many employees would you need? Okay. So what this means is, um, Five, so you have currently have 220 employees, five employees are going to leave. So only 215 are looking to return. How many employees would you need? 
Well, since you know that you need to retain the same number of employees, all that you're going to have to do is hire to match that turnover. So you're going to hire five employees in June, five employees in July, five employees in August. Okay. Number nine, you work in talent acquisition at Timmy's, okay, the head office. You're about to start interviewing for store managers. You learned in your previous HR class that interviews are subject to many common errors, which may limit the reliability or validity of the interview. Identify and describe four common interviewer mistakes. Again, we talked about, sorry, we talked about this. Um, one and a half marks for each interviewer mistake. Uh, here is the list. Okay. Poor planning, snap judgment, negative emphasis, table effect. We, we have these on the slide, but uh, here they are okay, for your purposes. Um, part B, your, your superior suggests you use semi structured interview transcript to guide your interview. I explain why you think this is a good or bad idea. Again, there's no right or wrong answer. Um, first thing I would do is I'd probably define what a semi structured interview is, like two marks, and then explain why it's whether it's a good or a bad idea. Okay. There we go. Defining semi structured. Here's the definition. And justify why it's good in comparison to structured interviews. Uh, semi structured is more flexible, less, rig less rigid, allows you to uh, ask extra questions. Um, they may also be less uh, considered less rigorous, so it might, can, might be considered more. You know, Sorry, this would be the second point. The second point. Uh, they all may also be considered less rigorous. Uh, it can be more difficult to fairly compare responses because they ask uh, maybe ask different questions. Right, so that's comparing the structure to a semi-structure. Okay. And then the last question, last old exam question I have for you is: You are a senior manager at Bloomberg okay, in New York City. All of your staff are highly educated and highly driven. Um, you are considering different ways to increase employee engagement of your staff. Uh, you know that simplified jobs often lead to lower satisfaction, higher athlete staff, and the turnover of educated workers. Okay. Uh, so here, find employee engagement. We talked about this earlier today. Employee engagement, again, based on the definition, the amount of commitment and dedication an employee has toward the job and the organization. Describe job design. So again, just another, another definition. Okay? Job design the process of systematically organizing work as tasks that are required to perform a specific job. Okay? There's two straightforward definitions. All right, C, using job design techniques, discuss two ways to modify job con content to improve employee engagement. So the trick here, using job design techniques. Okay. Here are the techniques that are identified for job design. Okay? There's a whole host of them and examples for each one. And then part D, if the majority of your staff are remote workers, okay, so they work virtually, which of these two recommendations would you recommend and why? And so that's the tricky part. So if they, um, I guess I just say that there's multiple different answers. Something to develop relationships with coworkers, because they are all working virtually. Okay, so an example might be a team-based job design. Okay. Oh, I actually have a bonus question for you guys. Um, number 11, so you work as a senior manager at Canadian Tires Head Office and one of your employees were injured at work. The injured employee informs you that he fell uh, on the way into the building because no assault had been made earlier in the morning to melt the ice. When talking to the injured employee's supervisor, you find out the injured employer was late for a meeting and was running to the parking lot. So this kind of refers to what I was talking about earlier today. That's what I was inspired by. Uh, the supervisor will also inform you that the injured employee entered through a side door, which is restricted to employees only, and that the customer entrance was well solved. So what were the main causes of the accident? Again, there's three main causes, potential main causes of all accidents. Okay? I hope you remember those by now. Chance currents, unsafe conditions, unsafe action. Could this accident have been prevented? Another good question. Uh, if yes, if, if yes, how? If not, why not? Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. We talk about weather, which is a chance occurrence, but then there's also unsafe conditions and unsafe actions. You can 
limited the likelihood of this accident by reducing unsafe conditions and reducing unsafe actions. All right, C, who is responsible? Uh, I hope that you say both the employer and the employee. Sometimes people just say one or the other. Uh, it's both. Explain how the employer led to unsafe conditions and the employee led to unsafe actions. Uh, and after the incident, the employee refused to come to work any day that it snowed, even if the company promises to change the, their salting schedule, he claims that he has the right to refuse unsafe work. What is likely to happen if the employee does not come to work on the next snow day? So the right to refuse unsafe work is, uh, is a right. Okay? If you feel, if it is legitimate that it's an unsafe working condition, their job is protected and they don't have to be there. However, uh, in this case, it needs to be determined whether the employee is in fact correct that it is an unsafe working condition. Okay? So here is the process that I would take. Since the employer is taking action to resolve the IC sidewalk, the un unsafe condition is likely removed. Okay? The, the employer may have to establish this fact. So if the employer um, does not remove the unsafe working condition, the employee cannot be punished for leaving, refusing to work in an unsafe environment. However, if the employer can remove the unsafe condition, okay, then the employer, uh, then the worker would be penalized or potentially terminated for not coming to work. And that is it for my review class.